Feel the power. Welcome to Righteous Invasion of Truth with Dr. Abel Damina. Hello, family and friends on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. I want to welcome you to the ever increasing world feast, and I'm excited today to have all of you connected to this broadcast. Abel Damina is my name. We are very committed to the vision of reintroducing Jesus to this generation, equipping the believer to know who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what Christ can do through you. Do me the favor today, invite somebody, share this video, tag somebody, you know, create watch parties, let's flood the entire Blue Marble planet with the fragrance of Jesus' grace. And I want you to know we're going to have an exciting time of studying the word of his grace on this particular broadcast today. Let me quickly mention that my two books are out. And if you don't have a copy of these books, I don't know what you're waiting for. Causes, Myth and the Truth. Very powerful material. You know, in this book, I talked about the language in which the Bible was written, use of words, the role of the Bible reader and the Bible teacher. The blessing and the curse, does God curse? The curse of the law, what of generational curses? Jesus and the fig tree and a lot more. It's a book you don't want to, you know, uh, go without, especially for people that have been threatened with curses before now. You know, what you don't know is bigger than you. Ignorance is the greatest undoing of any man. My people are destroyed not because Satan is powerful, but because they don't know. They have no knowledge. So get this material today. It will build you up and edify you and bring clarity. Then there's this other book on the communion table. Many people ask me so many questions on the communion, you know, and all of that. This book is very powerful. I wrote this book and there's a lot in it. Exegesis all over the book. The promise of God, the Old Testament feast, the difference between the Passover, breaking of bread, and the Lord's Supper, the Lord's table, and walking in love. Very powerful material. I'd like you to order for them, you know, and all other books that we have written. All of these efforts is to see that you are enriched in your work with Christ, that you maximize everything that Christ has provided for your spiritual edification. I'd like you to share with other people, you know, the things we are sharing with you here. Get more people to be connected. Get more people to order for the material. Right now on the screen, the phone number to call for the material is on the screen and the email address where you can send your orders to is also on the screen. There are also many other titles. I have written over 30 titles you can order and our office can send you all of the catalogs for it. Now, let me also mention, those of you that have been following my teachings who don't have a local church where you attend, where Christ is revealed, God wants you to live among brethren. God doesn't want you to be isolated. The Bible says God has placed the solitary in families. The word of God tells you, I will bring you to your fold and I will give you pastors according to my heart who shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And he says, it shall come to pass that when you are fed, you shall not lack, you shall not fear, you shall not be dismayed. If you are in a location where there's no Bible teaching church, where Christ is revealed all the time, you've been following my teachings and you want to identify with one or you want to start a campus. We call our churches campuses. You want to start a campus. All you need to do is send me a mail, Damina at yahoo.com. We will equip you and train you and work together with you to create a campus in your locality so you become a lighthouse where other people seeking to know Christ can come around and be part of the fellowship and you can be pioneering a church there that will bring light to that community. You become a lighthouse in that society. I'm really excited about the opportunity God has given us as a ministry to enrich and equip believers all over the nations of the earth. Just before we go into the service, remember again that you need a pen, a notebook, and a Bible because it's going to be an exciting adventure as we adventure together into the word of his grace. My prayer for you today is that grace abound towards you, that you always have sufficiency in all things. You abound unto every good work in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let me mention, the study we're going to be having the next one, two weeks here on 
Facebook, YouTube every evening at 6 p.m. GMT plus one. The study we're going to be having is going to be a Bible school. We want to equip you and train you in the pursuit of the kingdom assignment that God has for your life. I want to encourage you every day at this same time, 12 noon GMT plus one, to get more people to be part of this broadcast so together we can lighten the dark places of the earth. Let me take you on a gospel adventure right now into that service where the spirit of our God is already moving. Happy viewing. Romans chapter 12, verse number 11. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Next verse. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. 13. Distributing to the necessity of saints, giving to hospitality. I'd like us to read it from the Message Bible, 12 from verse 11 to 13. Don't burn out. Don't burn out. Don't get where you're tired of serving, where you are, you know, too busy to serve. Don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Be alert, servants of the master. Next verse. Cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. No pressure should ever be too much for you that you're not found in the place of service in the house. Don't quit in hard times. Serving God is in and out of season. Observe, don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. 13. Help needy Christians. Be inventive in hospitality. Hallelujah. And so we began to talk about serving and you can see that we serve the Lord. And we began to look at the meaning of serving the Lord. Serving the Lord, we have established, is the fruit of salvation. The fruit of salvation. We said, you know, from the word of God, it says in the book of Philippians chapter 2 verse 12, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So there is a working out of salvation that a believer is required to do. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Next verse. For it is God which worketh in you but to will and to do of his good pleasure. So, there is a working of God in the heart of the believer that is saved. And the proof of that God is working in the heart of a man that is saved is that the man is willing and the man is doing something in the kingdom. Both to will and to do. So, any believer that is not serving in the house of God, it's one of the two things. It's either he's not saved, he's just a church member or is just a one of the crowd or he is saved but he's not allowing the work of God on his inside to find expression for it is God that worketh in you both to willingness and to do of his good pleasure in Isaiah chapter 1 he says for if you be willing and obedient you shall eat the good of the land if you be willing and obedient you shall eat the good of the land. For it is God that worketh in you, both to will and to do. So when God is working in a man, when a man is saved, the work of God in salvation will make that man willing and will make that man do. You know, he won't be grudging. He will be so excited. He will be willing. He will be available. He will not quit in hard times. We saw that. He will not quit under pressure. He is not off and on. He is consistently constant. He is in and out of season constant. Always. Look at Romans chapter 1 verse 9. Brother Paul talking about service. For God is my witness. Whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. That without season. Consistency. That without season. I make mention of you always in my prayers. I serve without season. I serve in season. I serve out of season. Why? God is at work in me, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And the work of God in my heart is constant. 
God's work in my heart is not off and on. The work of God in my heart is constant. Whether things are good or not, I am found in the place of serving. The word of God tells us, blessed is the man whom his Lord shall so find doing. A man that is growing spiritually, the proof that you are not just hearing epignosis upon epignosis and it is falling on deaf ears, is that it will produce in you a willingness and it will produce in you a desire to serve. The fruit of spiritual growth is service. The proof of spiritual growth is service. So there is a work of God in the believer, which means that the Christian life involves work. It involves labor. It involves service. The Christian life involves work. It involves labor. It involves service. Look at Matthew 20, 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, the Son of Man did not come to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. He came to minister. Jesus came to serve. So if I am going to live on earth, uh, I will have to serve because that is Christ-likeness. He came to serve. Serving Christ is serving his body. Serving Christ is serving his body. You cannot say you are serving Christ and you are not serving the body. Jesus and his body cannot be separated. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you persecute. As long as you did it to one of the least of my brethren, you did it to me. You cannot claim you love God and you don't love the church. You cannot claim you love God and you do not love the brethren. You cannot claim you love God and you're not committed to the brethren. The proof of your love is in serving the brethren. The proof of your love for Jesus is in serving the brethren. And any person in the church that is not serving is not growing. Anybody, I don't care how much Greek and Hebrew you can quote. If you are not positioned to serve, you are not growing at all. What you have is carnal knowledge. Galatians chapter 5 verse 13. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. But by love, serve one another. By love, serve one another. Anyone, anyone in the church that is not serving, does he love Jesus? Anybody in the church that is not serving doesn't love Jesus. You cannot love Jesus and not serve his body. Mm -mm. You cannot. Except he's another Jesus you're serving. You cannot love Jesus and not serve his body. Serving his body is the proof of your love for him. Serving his body is the proof of your love for him. So we have established that the body of Christ is the primary place for service. And we have also established that you will only be rewarded. You will only be rewarded for serving the body. You will not be rewarded for being philanthropic. There is no reward for being philanthropic in eternity. There is no reward for moving around and helping poor, poor people on the road. There's no reward. The reward is what you have done in his body. Whether it be good or bad, that is what will be rewarded. What you have done in his body. So you get rewarded for serving his body. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That everyone may receive the things done in his body. According to that he had done. Whether it be good or bad. You will be rewarded. You cannot go free. As a member of the body of Christ. And as a member of this local church. All of you have reward. All of you. You have reward. It's just that. Some it will be good. And some it will be bad. It's according to what you have done. But you will be rewarded. 
there are people that will be rewarded for bad. And there are people that will be rewarded for good. So you can't go free. So you, it's even better that you now decide to serve so you can be rewarded for good. But whether you serve or not, you will be rewarded. Look at it now. For we must all appear. How many of us? Uh -huh. Before the judgment seat of Christ. That everyone, not some. That everyone may receive the things done in his body. In the body of Christ. According to that he had done. Whether it be good or bad. Whether it be good or bad. Ladies and gentlemen. This is a very serious matter we are dealing with here. You cannot be rewarded for what you did not do in the body. Your reward is for what you have done in the body of Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 11. And through thy knowledge, thy shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. Through thy knowledge, you have too much knowledge... And because of that knowledge, you are behaving in a way that you have wounded a brother. That is a bad service in the body of Christ. And you will be rewarded for wounding that brother for whom Jesus died. Look at the next verse there. But when you sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. That's the only place in the Bible you will see it clearly written like that. You sin against Christ. Give me that same scripture, verse 1. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. How many of us? All. Knowledge perfect up, but charity edified. There are two dimensions of people in the body. There are those that have knowledge that puffs them up and makes them self-centered. Knowledge that is centered on selfishness. Knowledge that tries to prove a point at the expense of a relationship. Knowledge that is willing to prove a point and lose a relationship. Knowledge that you think you know too much and you cannot be humble, you cannot correct yourself, you cannot make adjustments, and the fruit of the spirit cannot find expression through you. That knowledge is a puffy knowledge. It is carnal knowledge. The knowledge you should have is the knowledge that produces charity. Knowledge that produces love. Knowledge that makes you love the brethren. Knowledge that makes you want to serve the brethren. So, the proof of knowledge is that the more I grow in knowledge, the humbler I become. And the more available I am to be used. The more I grow in knowledge, the proof of your growth in knowledge is that you become more humble, you become more weak, and you become available for usage. Everyone said, nobody's going to use me in this church. Okay, then get out. Because if you are in this church at all, you will be used. You are here to be used. Somebody say, use me. That's right. You are here to be used. You are here to be used. Once you are saved, what is the next thing? You serve. So, carnal knowledge, perfect. But charity, which is love for God and love for the brethren, edify it. So, the more I grow in knowledge, the more I should be available to serve the brethren. Somebody shout hallelujah. Anyone not well tested with service and submission to authority. Is not fit to be granted the privilege of leadership. Anyone that is not tested with service and submission to authority should not be granted the privilege of leadership. Anybody that is not serving and submissive to authority cannot be trusted with the privilege of leadership. Cannot. And I'll show you why. Cannot be trusted. No pastor should trust anybody that is not submissive and not available for service. Every time you have an excuse. Every time you're malfunctioning. You are the reason for many lapses. 
You are the reason for many lapses. You are capable. You are competent. But you lack faithfulness. You are capable. You are competent. But you are very unreliable. You are a broken tooth. Bible says trusting in an unfaithful man is like a broken tooth. You are a weak link. A weak link in the body. You are a weak link. When Satan wants to hit the body, he uses you to hit it. Because you are not faithful, you are not reliable. You are a weak link. So a man that lacks that quality of service and submission to authority cannot be trusted with the privilege of leadership. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 10, look at it. And let this also first be proved. Let this also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. That is why in Acts chapter 6 he said, let us look out. He didn't say let's appoint everybody in the church. He said, let us look out from among you. Let us be looking out because it's not automatic. It's a privilege. Let us look out from among you. Once they put the word look out for, it means there is a qualification. Once you hear the word look out for, it means there is a qualification. It's no more church as usual. It means there is a qualification. Let look out from among you men of honest report. Qualification begins. Full of the Holy Ghost. Honest. Whom we may appoint over this business. What was the problem? Widows were neglected in sharing food. So they say, the only people that can be given that part are people that are honest. Not people that will take some and hide from the widows and take home. Not people that instead of serving people, they'll be serving themselves. At every little opportunity, they take their own and keep aside. No, no, no. Honest men are not thinking of themselves. Their interest is the assignment given to them delivered well. This is the kingdom of God we are talking about. This is the house of God. This is the house of God. We are dealing with eternal issues here. We are dealing with eternal issues here. Let this first be proved. If you look at that first Timothy 3 verse 5. See the way brother Paul will put it there. For if a man know not how to rule his own house. How shall he take care of the church of God? So the way you handle your wife and children is critical. It's an indication of how you will handle a house fellowship. The way you handle your wife and children is an indication of how you will handle a disciple given to you. A man that is not faithful in little cannot be trusted with much. Faithfulness in little makes you a ruler over much. Jesus teaching. He that is faithful in another man's will have his own. He that is not faithful in another man's who shall commit to you the true riches. Jesus teaching. It is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. A faithful man shall abound with blessing. It is required. It is imperative. It is a necessity. Look at the next verse. In that Timothy we were reading. Not a novice. A worker in the house of God cannot be a novice. A worker in the kingdom cannot be a novice. Lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. A novice is a man that is easy to walk in dishonor. A novice is a man or a woman that can easily walk in dishonor. Because dishonor will destroy a novice. A novice is one who does not want to attend training camps like this. A novice is one that has more serious issues of life to attend to than come and sit down here and be equipped for the royal assignment of the kingdom. A novice is one who does not know but thinks he knows too much because he has two Hebrew words and three Greek words in his vocabulary. 
a novice is one who does not know anything. But because he can quote certain scriptures, he thinks he knows it. That's a novice. A novice is one who does not know and does not know that he does not know. A novice is one who does not know and does not know that he does not know. Such a person cannot be trusted with the privilege of leadership. That's why spiritual growth is the acid test. Because if you're really growing spiritually, the natural thing will be service. The natural thing will be service. If you're really growing. Don't your neighbor say growing grace. Growing knowledge. Say to your neighbor again, growing grace. Growing knowledge. Don't be afraid of your neighbor. Say in the name of Jesus. I pray for you today. That you grow in grace. You grow in knowledge. And you serve the body of Christ. We will all be the better for it. In Jesus name. I didn't hear a powerful amen. amen. So we have looked at serving the Lord where it first began with giving. Where it first began with giving. You cannot separate money from your salvation. Money and salvation are intertwined. Where your treasure is, there your heart is. You cannot serve God and mammon. You are either serving God or you are serving mammon. We saw from God's word, charge them that are rich in this world not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us all things richly to enjoy, that they be, they be ready to distribute, that they be ready to distribute, willing to communicate, that they lay for themselves a good foundation against the time to come. Eternity is bigger than this temporal life. So if there's anywhere you should have more of your investment, it's in eternity. Eternity is bigger and eternity is longer. In fact, there's nothing in this temporal world that can be compared to eternity. So what you do here is waiting for you there as a believer. Every service, every giving, and every commitment. And we took time to deal with that very squarely. And I will still get there in a short while in the course of this training. Because it's very critical. Yesterday we also saw that prayer is a service in the house of the Lord. Prayer is a service in the house of the Lord. We give ourselves to prayer. Prayer is a ministry for believers. We pray for one another. We pray for our man of God. We pray for the work of God. We serve in prayer. Praying always. Praying constantly is a ministry. The book of Mark chapter 16, 15. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. He didn't say go into all the world and gather crowds. He said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. There's a difference between preaching the gospel and gathering crowds. Please pay attention. In Romans chapter 10, because we must define what it means to preach the gospel. We have to define it. Because in church history, there was a time when churches wanted to grow. They wanted to grow. And they were tired of small, small churches. They wanted to grow. So, a movement came out. I do not doubt the integrity of that movement. But this movement came out. And they called themselves church growth movement. Church growth movement. People were taught how to grow churches. Anyhow. Anyhow, if you see people with problem, promise them that once they come to our church, their problem will be solved. Anyhow, print handbills and distribute. Ask them to come for miracles. Anyhow, 
So churches began to grow. And what became the outcome of growing churches? What became the outcome? Mixed multitudes. Unbelievers were brought into the church who are not born again and they were rebranded as believers. Just pack them and bring them from anywhere. Go to the highways and byways. Pack them and bring. Because we must grow the church by all means. So we have a lot of people in churches who are not born again. We have a lot of people in churches who don't even know what it means to be born again. That's the downside. So listen carefully because he didn't say go and gather crowds. He said go and preach the gospel. Go and preach the gospel. Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Shall be saved. So, believing will come before calling. Believing will come before calling. They have to believe. What he's saying here is not saying just anybody say, Jesus, 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 I believe you're a son of God. No, 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 no. When he says, whoever shall call on the name of the Lord, that word call is the word kaleo in the Greek. It, it means to call by conviction or to call by knowledge. To call by conviction or to call by knowledge. People can call Jesus, but they don't believe in him. There are even people called Jesus in our time. So the calling there is a confession of faith. The calling there is a confession of faith. Put up that Romans chapter 10 verse 13 again. Let me read down to 17. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Next verse. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? If your Bible was mine, that's a key place to underline. How shall they hear without a preacher? So the salvation of men is in the hands of men. The salvation of men is in the hands of men. It is men that will preach. And it is what they preach that will determine salvation. It is men that will preach. And it is what they preach that will determine salvation. So if what you preach is not the word of faith, what you have produced is false converts, false believers. So the calling there is a confession of faith. That's why if you read on, he now says in verse 15, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Next verse. But they have not all obeyed or believed the gospel. For Isaiah, Isaiah saith, Lord, who had believed our report, our aman, our message, our message, who has believed our message? Then brother Paul answered Isaiah. So then, faith by hearing. Hearing by the message of Christ. Faith by hearing. Hearing by the message of Christ. The word heard. How can they believe on who they have not heard? It's a Greek word, akohen. It, it, it means... How can they heed? How can they heed? How can they heed to a message they have not heard? So, the message must be clear for there to be salvation. Was the name of Jesus popular? Yes, people call it all over the place. But that they called the name they didn't mean they were saved. So he's not talking about just calling a name. He's talking about believing a message. Somebody shout the message. Can I hear you shout it again? Somebody say the message. You know, uh, many of us were exposed to Christianity as an organized religion. You are born in a Christian home. You are, you, are, you are forced to pray. You are forced to go to church. Whether you like it or not. And that is why sometimes you go to church. They give you offering. You hide it and use it to eat chingom after. 
Your mother will say, did you give the offering? You say, yes. But you use it to eat chingon because you don't believe in what they are doing. But they are forcing you to go to church. So you go to church. They are forcing you to pray. So you just memorize certain lines. Every time they say pray, it is the same lines you will drop. Every time they say pray, it is the same line. Father, all of us are sinners, including daddy and mommy. Forgive us. Amen. Every time, they, because you are forced. You don't understand what you're doing. You're just forced. And because of that, we have religion as an organization all over the place. Everybody goes to church. So, because everybody goes to church, it's difficult to know who is not a Christian. Everybody goes to church. It's an organization. Now, please pay attention. Pay attention. In verse 14, he now says of that Romans, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed. How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? Whom they have not heard. I'd like you to underline the word heard. So people are saved by the message they hear. Which will mean that the message has content. The message has content because he says how can they preach except they be sent to send means I gave you something to do or something to say so nobody preaches his own ideas he must have been sent look at verse 15 of that same Romans and how shall they preach except they be sent so that means there's a message will be sent to preach. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So there's a message to preach. So why am I preaching the gospel? Four things. Four things. Why am I preaching the gospel? Four things we're going to outline quickly. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. Put it up for me. Therefore, if any man in Christ is a new creature, all things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Next verse, 18. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Next verse. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them and had committed to us the word of reconciliation. He has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So observe, we are new creatures in verse 17. In verse 18, he has given to us a ministry. We have been given a ministry of reconciliation, verse 18. Verse 19, he has given to us the message of reconciliation. Verse 17, we are new creatures. Verse 18, we've been given a ministry as new creatures. Verse 19, we have a message. So, we are born again. We are given a ministry by new birth. And the ministry has a definite message. Is it getting clear here? We are born again. We've been given a ministry and the ministry has a message that has definite terms. The ministry has a message that has definite terms. So question, why am I preaching the gospel? Number one, I have been saved by the gospel. So since I have been saved by the gospel, I preach that gospel that saved me. I have been saved by the gospel. And since I have been saved by the gospel, I preach that gospel that saved me. Because if you are not saved by the gospel, how can you preach the gospel? I can only talk about what has happened to me. What saved me? So I preach the gospel that saved me. Number two, I have been sent by the gospel. I have been sent by the same message that saved me. I have been sent by the same message. Number three, I must stand by the gospel. I must stand by the gospel. Number four, I must preach the gospel. I must preach the gospel. 
So he gave us a definite message. Why are we particular about this message? He gave us a definite message. Why are we particular about the message? Because brother Paul warns particularly about this. Galatians 1 verse 3. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4. Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Next verse. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Next verse. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Unto another gospel. In other words, it is possible for someone to be saved by the gospel and to follow another gospel. It is possible for someone to be saved by the gospel of Christ and become a follower of another gospel. So brother Paul said you have been called to the grace of Christ. Meaning you are born again. But what you are following is not the message that saved you. What you are following is another gospel. Put up that Galatians chapter 1 again. Uh, chapter 1 verse 7 now. Which is not another. They are following a gospel that is not the gospel. But there will be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. They will pervert the gospel of Christ. The word another gospel is the Greek word eteros eugelion. Eteros eugelion. The funny thing is that in that another, there is gospel inside. Another gospel. That is why it's tricky. That another has a gospel. So you must know the gospel of Christ well to identify another. You must know the gospel of Christ well to identify another. If you don't know the gospel of Christ, you wouldn't know the difference. You must have original or you must have tested original to know imitation. Imitation can be so good that if you don't know what original is, Imitation can pass for original. So you must know the gospel. The word eugelion is the word for glad tidings or good news. So it will be good news but another kind. Good news but another kind of good news. Eteros means another which is not another. Look at verse 8 of that Galatians chapter 1, verse 8. Please pay attention. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be a cause. The word a cause is the Greek word anathema. Let him be cut off. Anathema. That is, disconnect yourself from the person that is peddling that news that is not the news of Christ. Cut off anathema. Don't tolerate him. Don't pamper him. Don't be diplomatic about it. Cut him off. Verse 9. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be a cause. Emphasis. Emphasis. In the same chapter, brother Paul repeated it again. Look at verse 10 now. Glory to God. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. If I'm preaching to make people happy, then Jesus didn't send me. If I'm preaching to make people happy, then Jesus didn't send me. Because if Jesus sent me, the person's happiness I should be concerned about is the happiness of Jesus who sent me. That's the person that matters to me. That's the person that matters. That the person who has sent me is happy with what I'm preaching. That's what matters. Not the people that I'm preaching to. To be a servant of Christ 
If I choose to please men, I'm not a servant of Christ. The moment I preach what people want, I am not a servant of Christ. The moment I preach what people want, I'm not a servant of Christ. Your, if your message is dependent on what people want to hear, you're not a servant of Christ. The good news we are preaching is called the grace of God. It's called the grace of God. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. But God commended his love towards us. In that, while we were yet seen as Christ died for us. That's the good news. Romans 4.25. Who was delivered for our offenses. And was raised again for our justification. Was raised again for our justification. That's the gospel of Christ. Another gospel will not have these narratives. The gospel of Christ says he was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 4. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached or if you receive another spirit which you have not received or another gospel which you have not accepted you might well bear with him. So, there is another Jesus. There is another gospel. There is another spirit. So, when you see people saying they are moving in the spirit, you need to find out what spirit. When somebody say in Jesus' name, you need to find out with Jesus. When somebody say I'm a preacher of the gospel, you need to find out which gospel. There is another gospel. There is another spirit. There is another Jesus. That makes it very important for you to understand the message. It is the gospel that determines the spirit that determines the Jesus. It is the message that determines the spirit in oppression and the Jesus that is being pronounced. The message. Very important. The message. So there's a possibility for people to believe another Jesus. There is possibility for people to believe another Jesus. There is possibility for people to believe another spirit. And there is possibility for people to believe another gospel. And of course, when people believe another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel, they will never grow. They cannot grow. There is no spiritual growth in another Jesus. There is no spiritual growth in another spirit. There is no spiritual growth in another gospel. That's why Peter will say, as newborn babes, desire the sincere, the qualifier there for sincere means there is insincere milk. And if you're going to grow in the things of the spirit, you've got to feed from the sincere milk. Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 2. That you may grow thereby. So, there are people that preach things that lure. Churches going out with flyers. And on the flyers, there are testimonies to try to cajole people, to try to manipulate people. To try to draw people. False conversion. Another gospel. Sharing handbills is not the gospel of Christ. Using testimony to draw people is not. We are not salesmen. We are not salesmen. We are not selling articles. Our mandate is clear and the message is definite. The message has definite terms. Do you want Jesus to solve your problem? Do you want to make heaven? That's not the gospel. Nothing Jesus in it. Nothing Jesus in it. Messages that attract greed and covetousness. Messages that attract greed and covetousness. Praise the Lord. I have only been in this church for three weeks. The evidence is outside. Is a Jeep 2020 model. Greed and covetousness. That's not the gospel of Christ. 
That's not the gospel of Christ. That's why you will never in see in Jesus' meeting, testimony time. You will never see that. Jesus never said, come, come, come. So what was the problem before? What is it now? You will not find that in Jesus' ministry and you will not find it in apostolic tradition. You won't find it in the tradition of the apostles. And the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus himself, the cornerstone. Except is another Jesus. And it's very easy to know where another Jesus is operating. If you know how the real Jesus operates. I'm, I don't know if I'm complicating at all. It's very easy. You must know the original to point out the imitation. It's not showmanship. This is too expensive for showmanship. It cost God his life. So, very important. We preach the word of faith. We preach the message of Christ. Remember, there are people that followed Jesus but did not believe in Jesus. One of them was Judas Iscariot. One of them was Judas Iscariot. Do you know that the disciples of Jesus only got saved in the resurrection? Huh? They only got saved in the resurrection. Faith cannot be found in dreams and visions. Faith cannot be found in dreams and visions. And faith cannot be found in scary stories. I died and went to heaven on the way they stopped me and branched me to hell. The place is hard. If you don't want to go where I just went, come out and be born again. That is another gospel. That is another gospel. There is no faith in scary stories. There is no faith in personal experiences. There is no faith in dreams and visions. And what saves is the word of faith which we preach. We preach the word of faith, the message of faith, not personal experiences. There is no salvation in personal experiences. Faith is only found in the message of Jesus Christ. Faith is only found in the message of Jesus Christ. But you see, when you are under pressure for church growth, when you are under pressure for fast growing church, you will compromise the message. Any pastor, any church that is in a hurry to fill up their building and overflow the building and start running multiple services, if you check their message, it has been compromised. Because the only way you can quickly gather people is by compromising the message. If it is the message of Christ, it is processed one person at a time. The message of Christ is processed. It takes people one person at a time. Builds the person. The message of Christ does not gather people like that. No. Jesus himself, he came to save people. He called one by one. Bah! Come. Bah! Come. Bah! Come. Three and a half years. Twelve members. Three and a half years. Twelve members. This is God himself pastoring a church. Three and a half years, only 12 members. Which one of them went to hell? If it is the message of Christ, it takes time. Am I teaching here? That's why the long suffering of God is salvation. That's why there is long suffering in God. Because he himself knows the way his message works. I'm teaching good? 12 people only. But by the time he finished with these 12 people, take up an hour. By the time he finished with these 12 people, he said, I'm gone. Guys, take charge. These 12 men shook the world. People are shouting, the men that have turned the world upside down. 
Let me tell you the truth. It takes God a lot to invest into one person. When you see a man that God has raised, that's why you don't play with people that have given themselves to be raised by God. Because it takes God a lot to produce one person. It takes God a lot of investment to produce one person. It takes God time and it takes God untiring investment. That's why you can see the way we are painstakingly taking the time to build you, to train you, to teach you. It's taking time. It's taking time. It's taking time. But surely and slowly we will get there. Yeah. Surely and slowly. We are not rushing anywhere. Because what will last takes time to be built. Am I talking to somebody here? Yeah. So the message of Christ takes time. The message of Christ, you don't have to be under pressure to get people. We want to grow. Yes, we want to grow. Left to me, I want the whole of you to be in this church. Pull down this building, build five times the size of this building. Put the whole of this city in here. But we cannot grow at the detriment of the message. We would rather go slowly and maintain the quality of the message. We would rather go slowly and maintain the quality of the message. And this applies to all our campuses that are watching right now all over the world. Why do we want to grow? The only reason why we want to grow is because we want more people to be saved so they will know Christ. Finish. We want more people to be saved so they will know Christ. We are not looking for how to grow so we can, we can enter the world encyclopedia for the biggest church in Africa. No! We want to grow so that more people can be brought to the knowledge of Christ and trained. Basic. 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 Once your motive for evangelism is to gather crowd, you will compromise the message. You will exaggerate testimonies. You will arrange miracles. You will lie. Once your motive for evangelism is to impress. Some churches will even tell you, the person that will bring more people, there is, a, there is an award. We will give you an award. So people will go and lie. They will gather their friends and say, one, two, three, four, five, twenty of you, please. Church will give me an award. We will share it. Make going to follow me. So they will come to church and feel everywhere, but none of them is hearing anything. None of them. None of them. Are you here? I've been there. Before this message became clear to me, we also wanted to grow this church by all means. We're packing people from everywhere, sending buses every time, packing people. They will come here and be sleeping. <laughs> all the people we pack and brought here, I'm not sure up to 10 of them are still here. They will just come and be sleeping. Since I didn't want to come, you people gave me free transportation. I said we should come. And this place is fine. Let me just come and say, I'm preaching they are sleeping. Want to grow by all means, you compromise. So the man talking to you is not a novice. I've been in this and I can tell you what will work and what will not work. Say, I hear you. There's nothing you're going to tell me about ministry that is new to me. I'm not joking. <laughs> Look at my face. <laughs> Don't be deceived by this smooth skin. It's grace. These eyes have seen something. I've been around. And I can tell you what does not work. So listen to me carefully. The person talking to you is not a, an NYSC member in the ministry. I've been around. Somebody shout Hallelujah. So any church that is trying to grow fast, 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 fast will compromise the message. And look at the danger of another gospel is eternal. The danger of another gospel is eternal. You build your ministry on miracles. After a while, you start stage managing the miracles and exaggerating. But you preach and teach the word. Preach and teach the word. Miracles will follow the word. Miracles will follow the Lord. Do not do evangelism out of 
obligation. Otherwise, you will compromise. Soul winning or preaching the gospel is a conviction from the heart. Soul winning or preaching the gospel is a conviction from the heart. It must be born out of conviction in your heart. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 14, Brother Paul said, the love of Christ constrains us. I will question any soul winner that does not pray for souls. To be a genuine soul winner, there must be a man given to prayer. Because prayer will bring compassion. Jesus prayed. The apostles prayed. Because the message is a message of faith. Therefore, we pray so that when we speak it, faith will come alive. And if it's not the gospel of Christ, it will be another gospel. Am I still speaking here? Am I still speaking here? Yeah. So we're not training you to bring souls to church. We are not training you to go and be parking people. The training you are receiving here is to make disciples. Somebody say make disciples. Yeah. Now, that word disciple flowed from the four gospels into the acts of the apostles into the New Testament. The word disciples. In other words, as I go out to preach, there is a clear direction as to what I am going to do. I am not going to go and bring people to fill our church. I'm not going to go and bring people to increase our membership. So we don't have to be all kinds of organized food, organized clothes so that people will come and collect clothes and eat food. No. Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Next verse. Go ye therefore, if your Bible was mine, I will underline that, and teach, I will circle teach, and teach all nations. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. That baptizing them is not in the original. Next verse. Teaching them. Go ye therefore, teach, teaching. Underline teach, teaching. So it's not go and gather church members. Go and teach. Go and raise disciples. So what is evangelism? Evangelism is a platform for raising disciples. Go and raise disciples. It's not a place to go and share handbills and share CDs and share t-shirts. No. Go and raise disciples. That's why when preaching the gospel, don't rush. Now that I'm saying you should stay for three months on one person. When you go out, go out knowing exactly what to do. I preach the gospel for people to be saved. Number one, then follow Christ. For people to be saved first, then follow Christ. So you find the word disciple 263 times. The word disciple is used in the New Testament. 263 times, 31 times in the book of Acts. Now let's see where it is first used. Matthew chapter 5 verse 1. The word disciple. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. Underline that word disciples. That's the first place it is mentioned. His disciples came unto him. Matthew Chapter 4 verse 19. And he saith unto them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. If that, your Bible was mine, that whole verse, I will underline it. And he saith unto them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I will make you fishers of men. From fishers of things to fishers of men. From fishers of things to fishers of men. Remember, they were fishing fish. So Jesus took them from fishing things to fishing men. I will make you fishers of men. I will make you fishers of men. Fishers of... You know this song? I will make you fishers of men if you... 
If you follow me, if you follow me, I will make you. Those are the songs they taught us when we got born again for evangelism. I will make you fishers of men. Follow me. When you find purpose in the gospel, your attention leaves things for men. The moment you find purpose in the gospel, your attention will move from things to men. To the expansion of God's kingdom. I will make you fishers of men. So, in the gospel, we are made. In the gospel, we are made. We don't come to the gospel and remain the same. We are made in the gospel. There are things we become. Purpose comes into our lives. Once you come to Christ, purpose comes into your life. I will make you fishers of men. So he took them from things to men. And they left their nets. And they left their nets. Jesus went teaching and explaining. He would spend several hours teaching and explaining. He began to personalize the disciples after some time. Look at it. Matthew 26, 18. He began to personalize the disciples. And he said, go into the city to such a man and say unto him, the master saith, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. No more just disciples. My disciples. With my disciples. He personalizes it. Matthew 14, 14. Luke 22, 11. Disciples of Jesus Christ. Are you going out on evangelism to raise disciples for Jesus? Or what's your motive for evangelism? Because the whole mission should be to raise disciples for Jesus. So we will find out who a disciple is. John 8, 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews who believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. If you continue, so disciples are known by the message. Disciples are recognized by the message. If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed? John 13, 35. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have love one to another. John 15, 8. Herein is my father glorified. That you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. So shall you be personalized. So who is a disciple? Who is a disciple? The word disciple is the word mathetes. M-A-T-H-E-T-E-S. Mathetes. Is someone who is learning. A disciple is someone who is learning. Or a student. A disciple is a student. The word math means mental work. Mathematics. Maths. Mental work. Mathethes. Mental work. That means the disciple is one who has a change of mindset. The disciple is one who has a change of mindset. Another associated word with mathethes is the word matheno. M A T H. E-N-O, materno, it means to learn, to learn. Matthes, a student. Matheno, to learn, Matthew 9, 13. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not called to the righteous, but sinners to repentance. 
he is learning. A disciple is one who is learning. A disciple is a student who is learning. Matthew eleven twenty nine. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Learn of me. To learn of Christ. To learn of Christ. So when you are going out to preach, you want men to learn of Christ. Preaching is teaching men Christ. Evangelism is not sharing handbills or tracts. Evangelism is turning men into students to learn of Christ. You didn't hear that. Evangelism is turning men into students that will learn of Christ. Matheno. To learn. Now please write this down. It means to realize. To realize, to come to realize. Or learning comes by instruction. Or it comes by explanation. You must explain. What is evangelism? Explanation. You must explain. Jesus is not a way. Yeah, some people say, uh, how can you say Jesus is the only way? Even Muslims will go to heaven. Even if they don't repent, God loves everybody. Anybody preaching that is very dangerous. Don't just hang around him. Flee. Anybody who begins to say Jesus is a way, just like Muhammad is a way, just like Buddha is a way, because there are some people like that on social media that are peddling that heresy. Just like Guru Maharaji is a way. So all of them are ways and God loves everybody. It doesn't matter which way you come from. <laughs> Guru Maharaji can give you miracles. Buddha can give you miracles. Muhammad may give you miracles. Only Jesus gives life. And without life, you can't be found in heaven. I give you eternal life and you shall never perish. So until you receive eternal life, you perish. Jesus is the way. He is not a way shower. And he is not a way. He is the he, he is the embodiment of the way. When Jesus enters you, the way has entered. No man can come to the Father but by me. Say I hear you. So anybody telling you that Christianity is not the only religion. Any religion you like, you can be. As long as you have the fear of God. The way the man is talking, you know that he doesn't know anything. Jesus is the way. That's why we preach. We preach because Jesus is the only way. If you are not in Christ, you are lost. So that's why we now go out to preach. Jesus is not a way. He is the don't let people uh, try to preach the love of God in a sentimental way. Did you hear what I said? They are trying to preach the love of God. What? The love of God is not, <laughs> I feel it. Hey, the love of God is sacrifice. The death of Christ is the love of God. If you don't accept that death, you have rejected God's love. Did you hear what I just said? The death of Christ is the love of God. God commended his love towards us. What is that love? In that, while we were yet seen as, so if you reject Christ, you have rejected the love of God. And my friend, when you reject the love of God, you have secured for yourself a place in hell. What are you talking about? Don't be preaching the love of God out of emotionalism and sentimentalism and, and ignoremus ignoremusis. The love of God is the death of Christ. He that spared not his own son, but gave him up for us all. How shall he not also with him? So if you are not with him, you have no access to the things of God. No man can come to the father, but by me. He that has the son has life. The day you receive Christ, you pass from death to life. Without Christ, you are dead in sins and trespasses. 
That's very important. So that when you go for evangelism, somebody say, I'm a Muslim. We serve one God. He say, yes, it's one God. No, you go to. My God is not the same with the God of Muslims. Never. Never. The God of Muslims is Muhammad. He's in the grave rotting. My God is Jesus. He rose on the third day. And people saw it all over the place. It has historical details. And even the Quran of the Muslims has it in the Quran. That it is Jesus that will judge the world. It is too real to be denied. That even the Quran documented it. What are you talking about? There's a reason why I'm talking like this. I am up for the defense of the gospel. Don't go there and be saying we are, we are serving the same God. So if we are serving the same God, why did you come to preach? What have you come to say to me that I don't know since we are serving the same God? The essence for preaching is because they are in darkness, we are in the light. Say I hear you. Say I am in the light. Say I am in Christ. Say I have accepted the form of doctrine that was presented by the gospel of his death, burial, and resurrection. I didn't hear your amen. amen. And any man that is not of this persuasion is a target for evangelism. Even if he has a collar on his neck, even if he's wearing a cap on his head with a title, the arch pope of the 21st century, he is a target for evangelism. Everybody you go out for evangelism is a suspect except you prove otherwise. Even if their name is Jesus Jr. They are all suspects. You don't allow anybody intimidate on evangelism with the fact that he has a big family Bible. <laughs> Borrow it from him and interrogate him. Interrogate him. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? He will tell you, I have not heard about it. Then you know he's not born again. That's how Paul preached now. Have you received the Holy Ghost? Since you believe, they say, we have never even heard if there's any such things. <laughs> then he preached Christ. <laughs> and they got born again. He even asked them, he said, ha, but you've been baptized. They say, yes. Which kind of baptism did you receive? They said, the baptism of John. He said, these people don't know. They are far from the kingdom. <laughs> Let's start from kindergarten class. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. Somebody get him blessed. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. We have found him. Amen. Glory to God. We have found Christ. Jesus is not one of the ways. He is the way. Only Christ by salvation can give life. Only Christ. Others can do miracles. Others can prophesy. Only Jesus gives life. Jesus is God who became a man. So to learn means to understand. Acts 23, 27. This man was taken of the Jews and should have been killed of them. Then came I with an army and rescued him, having understood that he was a Roman. It means to understand. A man cannot claim to be born again when he does not understand Jesus Christ as his savior. The epistles use the same words. Look at Romans 16, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren. I beseech you who? Brethren. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. And do what? Avoid them. Give them a very comfortable distance. Avoid them. Next verse. Look at the problem of these people. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. It's like you're hearing good teaching from this pulpit. Then somebody comes from around the church and begins to tell you, I can even take you deeper than Papa. He will soon ask you for money for breakfast. They are not serving Christ. They are serving their belly. They are serving their belly. Look at it. Now I beseech you brethren. Mark them. 
which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. And avoid them. Avoid them. Avoid them. Why? Look at the next verse. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. You can't be serving Christ and be causing division in his body. Mm -mm. Anybody that comes to you to run down a brother and after running the brother down asks you for transport fare. Know what brought him. It's not the brother he ran down. Is the transport fare. He used the brother as a vehicle to get to you. And you should know that everything he told you is a lie. What he was looking for is how to collect transport. They serve not our Lord Jesus. They serve their belly. What is apostolic doctrine? He that does not walk should not eat. Let him that stole steal no more. Let him get a job with his hand. That he may get to give to him. That, that's apostolic practice. That's apostolic. Including those of you on Facebook and, and YouTube and all of you on social media. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 16. Wherefore I beseech you, be you followers of me. 17. For this cause have I sent unto you Timothy, who is my beloved son, and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of the way of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach in every church. Brother Paul is dealing with learning here. Learning. I teach. Learning. Look at 1 Corinthians 4, 6. We're dealing with discipleship. It's all about learning. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. Learn. So, discipleship means there is an ongoing learning. Ongoing learning. That's what discipleship is. Ongoing. The first learning is when you meet the sinner. That's the first learning. It is called evangelism. The first learning. The first message. The first message of Christ. You preach and somebody hears and gets born again. Once that begins, that's just the introduction to a world of learning. So that new convert has to be subjected to a lot of learning. That's what discipleship is. Look at Galatians chapter 3 verse 2. This only will I learn of you. Received ye the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. This only will I learn. 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 Ephesians 4.20 But you have not so learned Christ. So there is a learning of Christ required. You have not so learned Christ. So discipleship is the learning of Christ. The learning of Christ. Philippians chapter 4 verse 11. Now that I speak in respect of one, for I have learned, I have learned, in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Colossians 1 7. As you also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. You learn you learn. Somebody is teaching you. In discipleship, you have a new convert that you are teaching Christ. You don't just get them saved. You get them saved and you teach them Christ. That's discipleship. And that's what we've been asked to do. To go and make disciples. To go and make disciples. Look at the book of Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 7. This one is is ever learning negative and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. First Timothy 5 4 for widows. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn. Let them learn. Second Timothy 3 14. But continue thou, everybody, but continue thou 
in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. A learning of Christ. So what is spiritual growth? Spiritual growth is to continue to learn. Why do I preach the gospel? I preach the gospel for the sinner to continue to learn Christ. That learning is by faith. He knows Jesus. He is taught of Jesus. He is taught in Jesus. Titus 3.14 And let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses that they be not unfruitful. So there's a teaching going on. Discipleship. So when we talk about making disciples, what does it mean to make disciples? Making disciples is a process. Making disciples is a process. Is a process. It's not automatic. Is a Greek word, matetio. M-A-T-H-E-T-E-U-O. Matetio. It means a progressive learning. The art of making disciples is progressive learning. The art of making disciples is progressive learning. One of the platforms where a disciple will keep learning is church meetings like this. But we never make church meetings a priority. Actually, when you get people saved, the first priority, first priority is for them to continue to learn Christ. That's the first priority. Once we get people born again, the first priority is for them to continue to learn Christ. However, in the learning of Christ, they will have to belong to a local house where they are taught Christ. I don't know if you understand what I just said. Yes. So the main focus is not bring them to church. It's for them to learn Christ. However, in their learning of Christ, we bring them to a family where they grow along with other believers. Amen? Matthew 13, 52. Then said he unto them, Therefore, every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man. Instructed is the word instructed. Matthew 28 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Disciple making is teaching. Making disciples is a teaching time. Every time you meet your disciples, you have something to teach. And listen, in teaching disciples, make sure the teaching is progressive learning. Don't teach disciples in a haphazard way. Today you teach one thing. Tomorrow you go and teach another thing. Next month, just because you want to show off. No. There is patience in raising disciples. You teach the same thing until it enters. It can be boring. But that is why it is work. That is why it is work. If you are in the process of making soap or cream. You don't change the specimen and the, you don't change the combination because you are tired. I have produced 50, 50 bars of soap. <laughs> the same thing, the same thing. It's boring. Let us change it. The moment you change it, you have destroyed the business. So, if you are raising disciples, you, you don't raise disciples in excitement. You don't raise disciples in excitement. It is labor. It requires patience. You teach him. He will ask you the same question that he has asked you four times. You will answer as if he never asked. Are you understanding? You will answer as if he never asked. He will ask it again. You will feel like telling him, dummy. But you will not tell him, dummy. You will swallow it and answer like you didn't ask before. That's the process. That's the process. And sometimes when raising disciples, they can act very funny. So that you feel like you have not done anything. You must be patient. You must, like God has been patient with you. 
You too, when you behave sometimes, God will wonder whether are you in Christ or you are in yourself. <laughs> but he's patient with you. Can I hear a powerful amen? He's patient with you. He's long-suffering. And he lives in you. The same thing he does to us, we do to others. See, I hear you. Say with me, I make disciples. I didn't hear you. Can I hear you louder? Say with me, I am called to make disciples. I make disciples of all nations. I didn't hear a powerful amen. Yeah, we make disciples. Church planting is discipleship. Once you know how to make disciples, you can start churches everywhere. Because church planting begins with one, two, three, four, five. You disciple them. They disciple others. Who disciple others? Church has started. Church planting, there's no rocket science about it. It's simple disciple making. It's patience. It's commitment. It's persuasion. You win one. You train him. And in training him, you win others. You train them. Before you know it, the people you are training are also winning others and training. That's church planting. It's not today's kind of church planting where you just go and steal somebody's members. You enter a church, you make 15 friends inside a church. You enter them well, well. You enter them well, well. You enter them well, well. After you have entered them, they have entered you. You start doing prayer meetings. You start doing prayer meetings. You start doing prayer meetings. They don't know where you're going. They are following you like fools. You're doing prayer meetings. You start seeing personal visions for them. You start seeing personal visions for them. So they say, ah, you are even more sharper than Papa. You are sharper than Papa because all the time I've been, he has never seen a vision for me. You know, they are beginning to say, let us build three tabernacles. Before you know it, the brother will just leave. And as he leaves, half of the church has followed him. He goes to start church. He's building on another man's foundation. That person is not after Christ. He's after his stomach. People that are after Christ don't tear the body. They don't break the body. They don't. They don't wound the body. People that are after Christ, they don't. instead, they add to the body. Instead, they increase the body. And if they have any passion to go somewhere and do a fresh work, they go well. And they do it well as an extension of the existing body. Go into all the world and make disciples. Teach. Teaching them. Teach. Teaching them. We teach and we keep teaching. Amen. When you start making disciples, because everybody in this church is going to be involved. All of us are going to be involved. Everybody in this church is going to make disciples this year. I didn't hear a good amen. You will make your own disciples. And then you will disciple your disciples. And then you will make your disciples make disciples and disciple their disciples. I didn't hear a good amen. It's called the Great Commission. If you do it willingly, there is a reward. And if you don't do it willingly, you will do it by force. And there will be no reward. So it's better we do it willingly. Amen. Somebody say again, I make disciples. Say, I win many to righteousness. Now stand on your feet and say to me very loud, I'm going to shine like the stars forever. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. There, is there is a huge assignment ahead of us to make disciples, to bring men and women to the righteousness of God. It is labor. It is work. I am persuaded. We will walk this walk. We are committed to this walk. And this work shall be done. I didn't hear a powerful amen. Send me in the name of Jesus. I am strengthened with might by the spirit in the inner man. Christ dwells in my heart by faith. I am committed to the cause of Christ. I am committed to the assignment. I am committed to the kingdom. Above all, I am committed to Jesus my Lord. I didn't hear a powerful amen. Lift your right hand, Father. I pray for everybody in this building, online, and around the world, all our campuses, and everybody committed to this ministry. Thank you for the opportunity we have to learn, to grow, to be equipped, and to be grounded in the knowledge of Christ. I pray that grace abounds upon everyone hearing the sound of my voice as you equip us and prepare us for the huge tax of soul winning and discipleship ahead of us. So I decree that everyone here is rooted and grounded. And I declare that the knowledge of Christ grows big in our hearts. Passion for souls.
commitment to soul winning dedication to see men turn to righteousness our hearts are passionate our hearts are made up in the name of jesus thank you for grace in jesus precious name and every believer says that amen on a note of finality welcome back ladies and gentlemen welcome back it's been an adventure together studying and learning the things that christ will have us do to a generation that don't know him i believe that the word of god has blessed you and challenged you today i want to encourage you we have a mentoring academy where we can take time to equip you some more so if you're looking to study further with me i will encourage you to email me today to join my mentoring academy let me also mention if you live in a place where there's no bible teaching church where christ is revealed a church where you can learn the things you're learning from me here you can start one in your community you can start one in your locality and if you want to start one, we can train you, equip you, and work with you until a campus, that's what we call our churches, a campus is launched in your community. You're not learning all of these truths to just sit down somewhere. You're learning them so you can also teach others. Brother Paul said to Timothy, the things you have learned and heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men who shall in turn commit to others. Everything you're learning, is so that you can also be a blessing to other people. Remember, blessed to be a blessing. So if you want to start a campus today or you want to join one, send me an email, Damina at yahoo.com. We love you. Remember, we are live every day, 12 noon GMT plus one, 6 p.m. GMT plus one, and 10 p.m. GMT plus one. You don't want to miss what God is doing at this season equipping and preparing people that will take this gospel to the ends of the earth. We love you and look forward to hearing from you. And until we connect in the next broadcast, enjoy the grace of Christ. Amen.